nonprofit research organization running out of Berkeley. We operate on a budget of about a million and a half a year, and we mostly do math research related to AI, as I'll talk about in my presentation. We've just renamed ourselves, actually, from the Singularity Institute to Machine Intelligence Research Institute. So that will be our name going forward. And we're not associated with Singularity University, which you might have heard of. Singularity University does executive training and uh, sort of startup incubator stuff. And the Singularity Institute is much older and, and focuses on research. Uh, Andrew McAfee is a management scientist at MIT who wrote a great little book called Race Against the Machine. And Andrew likes to ask the question, what have been the most important developments in human history? Some people name important historical figures. Other people name uh, empires. Other people name intellectual breakthroughs in math or science or the arts. But how can we tell which of these are how can we tell which of these are really important? We can look up the data for how many people there were at a given time and how well off they were at that time. And whichever of these events uh, really mattered should bend those curves. So I want you to think about this for just a moment. Which of these things do you think bent the curves for world population and social welfare, or social development? So have an answer in mind. And now we'll look at the data. Uh, it was a trick question. When we chart the curves, we see that none of these things mattered at all. They didn't bend the curves at all. Cultural differences didn't matter either. The East and West are basically the same. The only thing that mattered was technology. Technology is what remakes our world. It's the most important thing we can think and talk about. And today I want to talk about the single most important technology that will ever be invented, which is superhuman artificial intelligence. Why is superhuman AI the most important technology that will ever be invented? Uh, it's because intelligence is powerful. In fact, intelligence is a lot like magic. In the ancient myths of the world, a person with magic could strike others dead or fly off into the sky or communicate with someone miles away or whatever. Well, intelligence is like magic, except that it's real. If you have enough intelligence, you can give yourself whatever other powers you might want, like talking to other people on, on the other side of the world with Skype. Uh, and, or, or the power of flight. We did finally, in fact, invent jetpacks. You just haven't seen them at your local Honda dealer because they're very expensive and highly, highly fatal. <laughs> uh, Arthur C. Clarke once said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and that's true. But where does the technology come from? It comes from intelligence. So we could also just as well say any sufficiently advanced intelligence is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, now, I don't say this next line very often, but Glenn Beck says some intelligent <laughs> things about this. <laughs> from his latest book, Cowards, he says, consider the difference between humans and chimpanzees, which share 95% of their genetic code. A relatively small difference in intelligence gave humans the ability to invent farming, writing, science, democracy, capitalism, birth control, vaccines, space travel, and iPhones. All while chimpanzees kept flinging hoo at each other. <laughs> now to a chimpanzee, the iPhone and the space shuttle are just magic. So intelligence is powerful. A small difference in brain architecture, and suddenly cities spring up on Earth and footprints appear on the moon. And human intelligence is pretty cool, but let's be honest, there's room for improvement. <laughs> I always like listening to the waves of laughter as different people get it. Um, yeah, so I don't just mean there's room for improvement from the uh, bottom rung of the species. Einstein might seem like he's vastly more intelligent than a guy who doesn't know how to use a hat, but the difference between them is dwarfed by the difference between the hat fail guy and a mouse, or between Albert Einstein and superhuman AI. And it's, it's really not fair. Einstein doesn't stand a chance against a superhuman AI. Einstein's intelligence runs on sluggish neurons. The AI can fire signals at light speed. Einstein's brain is trapped in a tiny skull. The AI's brain can be as big as a warehouse or a city. 
Einstein can't rewrite his own brain to make use of uh, breakthroughs in cognitive algorithms. Um, he ha he's stuck with the spaghetti code that evolution gave him. Uh, but when an AI discovers new cognitive algorithms, it can rewrite its own co code and become qualitatively smarter, and so on. So with these kinds of advantages, a superhuman AI can be incomprehensibly more effective at achieving its goals in the world than Einstein can. It can be incomprehensible incomprehensibly better at science, at music, at social manipulation. All of those things are functions of the brain, not of the kidneys. <laughs> but some people wonder, can we really create superhuman AI? Uh, and for this, I often give some historical perspective, but people always have great questions to this uh, topic, and so I'm going to skip the historical perspective and give us more time for questions. Um, so we've made a lot of progress in AI, but why do I think that we're going to get to superhuman AI? Many challenges remain. We still don't have machines that can write novels or play hockey or do uh, awesome paintings about you know, weird creatures and so on. Uh, some people believe we'll never make it to superhuman AI, but I think we will. Why do I think that? In short, it's because the human mind does what it does by way of information processing. And machines can do information processing too. Uh, this is the near universal in cognitive science. Minds are information processors. Many things look mysterious to us now, but the universal pattern of history is that things which look mysterious to us now turn out to have lawful explanations rather than explanations grounded in some ungraspable magic. Or as the comedian Tim Minchin put it, every mystery ever solved has turned out to be not magic. <laughs> Ray Kurzweil has a great illustration of this in one of his books. A man is frantically scribbling down things that only a human can do, and he's hanging them on the wall. But those predictions keep turning out to be wrong, and they fall to the floor. This picture was published in 1999, and since then, machines have conquered the driving cars thing, and we can see obvious progress on translating speech and cleaning houses. Basically, if you make these kinds of predictions about what machines can't do, you're going to end up on the wrong side of history, because intelligent behavior isn't magic, and we'll eventually figure it out. So it looks to me like we're on a course towards building superhuman AIs, and that is a really big deal. Uh, Jan Tallinn, the uh, co-creator of Skype and Kazaa, said, we became the dominant species on this planet by being the most intelligent species around. Out of the way. This century, we're going to see that crown to machines. After we do that, it will be them steering history rather than us. And the worry here, of course, is that superhuman AIs uh, steering the future instead of us might mean that they steer the future where somewhere we don't want it to go. So how do we get superhuman AIs to do what we want? It turns out this is incredibly difficult. We have to invent new math to figure this out, and that is the primary research focus of the Singularity Institute, now MIRI. To work on the most important math problems our species will ever face, uh, math problems about how to build superhuman AIs that do what we want instead of what we don't want. Now, the difficulty in a nutshell, in the, the non-technical version of this, is that there is a huge space of possible mind designs. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So this is a vast, vast space of possible mind designs, and almost none of them are ones that we want steering the future. If you pick a superhuman AI, and, or if you build a superhuman AI and you pick a mind over there, then it's this giant, messy kludge of narrow AI algorithms and brain-inspired algorithms, and it does a bunch of weird stuff that we can't predict in advance. Uh, you pick a mind somewhere else over there, and you get an AI that maximizes the number of paper clips in the universe, because it was designed by a paperclip factory. And then it goes on and uses all of our resources to do so, because it's a maximizer, and it does, every, it does whatever its goal is as much as it can and gathers as many resources as it can to do so. Uh, you pick a mind that's like kind of similar to that, and uh, it maximizes human pleasure. And you think, ah, oh, that's a good one, let's do that. So it hooks us all up to continuous heroin drips and we don't ever do anything cool. Darn, almost. Uh, so you pick a mind that's like pretty close to that one, but a little bit different. And, the a and you have it like maximize experiences of incredible pleasure and meaning and family and all kinds of good stuff. But it misses our one little value of novelty and it ends up just repeating the exact same experience over and over and over again for a billion years, uh, which is boring. 
So you pick a mind like a little bit to the left of that one, and you get an AI that does everything that we want, including novelty of experience. But then when the AI improves its own code for the one millionth time, this breaks its goal function, and everything goes wrong after that because you didn't solve the currently unsolved problem of what's called reflective decision theory. That's some of the new math that needs to be invented, and almost nobody is working on it. So to build superhuman AI safely, you've got to put in a bunch of extra work beyond just building superhuman AI that does stuff. So 30 years from now, when both the USA and China realize that they can seize a decisive military advantage if they throw a trillion dollars into superhuman AI development uh, and get there before anyone else, which one of them is going to slow down their research pro program in order to make sure they get the extra safety work done right as well? The philosopher David Chalmers actually discussed this very issue with staff members at West Point, and they agreed that the USA would not slow things down for safety's sake, because a global disaster from American AI is still better than a global disaster from Chinese AI. <laughs> but if we invest now in solving these open research problems, then when if the time comes and we invent superhuman AI, we might be able to get them to do what we want, which would be totally awesome. <laughs> Superhuman AIs doing what we want would be like having 10,000 Einsteins working to cure cancer or build spaceships to Mars, except Superhuman AI is actually even smarter than 10,000 Einsteins. And it doesn't stop with cancer cures and space exploration. Consider something as apparently basic to the human condition as pain. Pain is not a law of physics. It is a consequence of, one, current human biology, and two, our ignorance about how to modify and transcend hu current human biology. Pain is just a mechanism stumbled blindly upon by evolution uh, to inform us that, like, you should avoid that. But with enough intelligence, we could implement systems that give us that information without giving us the pain. In fact, that's how it works in robots today. So, yeah, life can be a lot better than we suppose. My colleague Elias Ryukowski once put it this way, Try convincing a hunter-gatherer from 10,000 years ago that someday people will invent an improved bow and arrow called a nuclear missile that wipes out everything in a 10-mile radius. How ridiculous something sounds to us today is not actually a good indicator of whether it is technologically feasible. We went from bow and arrow to nuclear missile with mere human intelligence. We really can't imagine what's possible with superhuman intelligence. But we don't get these benefits for free. Almost all possible arrangements of matter in the universe are not ones that uh, we want, and almost all mind designs that could be steering the future will steal the, steer the future places we don't want to go. So to get superhuman AI that does what we want, we have to find a very specific mind design in the space of trillions and trillions of possible minds and implement that one. So it's a needle in a haystack problem. We probably aren't going to find the needle if we aren't looking for it. And right now, almost nobody in AI is working on the problem of how... Right now, almost everybody in AI is working on the problem of how do we make AIs more capable, more powerful, more autonomous. Um, almost nobody is working on the problem of once we do that, how do we make sure they do things we want instead of things we don't want? Um, Oh yeah, so there, there are currently two small organizations, my organization, MIRI, and the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University in the UK, plus a few individuals scattered here and there who are working on these problems. The combined budget for this work is about one one hundredth of what is currently spent on lipstick research each year. We think it's more important than lipstick research. If our priorities remain like they are now, then in a few decades we might may find ourselves with incredibly powerful machines that we don't know how to control. But if we invest in figuring this stuff out, then we might get superhuman AIs that do what we want and thereby create a much, much, much better world.